William Hopefully your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to another Two Hats special of community events. Let's look in and see what's really happening. Good morning. Good morning. Can everybody hear me well in the back? All righty. Well, thank you all so very much uh, for being here. We are excited uh, about today's event. I'm Kimberly Tolbert. I'm the existing chief of staff, and y'all heard me say existing because <laughs> we hope we survive another 30 days. Uh, but I'm the uh, chief of staff to our uh, new Dallas City Manager, T.C. Broadnax. I want to welcome you all to the final installment of Breaking the Fourth Wall, a candid conversation. We're very pleased uh, to have you here today for today's conversation with our own, uh, very own U.S. Congresswoman, Eddie Bernice Johnson. I'm just honored to have the opportunity. She's behind the flag, but hello. <laughs> yeah. um, she brings a level of grace and passion to our public service profession that is unmatched. Breaking the Fourth Wall is hosted by the City of Dallas Best to introduce city staff to local and national figures who have broken barriers, defied the odds, and risen to excellence in their chosen fields. Past speakers have included Justin Anderson, a rookie Dallas Mavericks basketball player who helped get his team to the playoffs last year. Others have included Hollywood screenwriters Todd and Richie Jones, who worked on shows like In Living Color and movies including The Johnson Family Vacation and the animated features Rio and Rio 2. Each guest speaker brings a story that is very unique and very inspiring. But the unifying theme has, built, has been that each of these individuals have overcame obstacles along the way. They have pursued their passion and they maintained a commitment to excellence to get where they are today. I know that that is something that we all strive to do. The city of Dallas is very honored and very proud of our best and programs like Breaking the Fourth Wall because we know that human capital development is everyone's job and we never finish developing. So today I'm here to represent our city manager and welcome you all to this wonderful event and on behalf of our entire executive team we hope that you will enjoy today's conversation and that you will take these stories and stories like this, both now and in the future, and apply them to your professional growth and your development as you move forward within the organization. At this time, I'd like to introduce Regina Onyebe. She is the interviewer for today, representing our Economic Development Department. Regina. Good morning, my lovely brothers and sisters. How's everybody this morning? All right. Awesome. Thank you again for being here today. My I name, you. as Kim mentioned, is Thank Regina Hill Onyebe. I, I am so the much. Africa liaison for the city of Dallas, responsible for all bilateral trade and cultural exchange opportunities between the city of Dallas and the whole of Africa, with most of my concentration being in West Africa right now. And over the last nine years or so, we have had the most incredible success. We've had presidents, vice presidents, kings, queens, governors, ministers represented here at the city of Dallas from across the continent of Africa, north, south, east, and west. And it's something that I'm very, very proud of. They've brought us a lot of enrichment in our heritage and all things beautiful about Africa. But that's enough about me and what I do. They've also brought their $60 million in investment dollars as well to our EB-5 program, <laughs> as well as other um, investment opportunities outside of um, the immigration program that we do here through Civitas. First, I'd like to thank BEST for entrusting me with moderating for such a legend and icon as we have sitting here in our midst today, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. Congresswoman, I just want to say on a personal note to you, you have mentored me from afar without even knowing through your actions as a woman, Thank you. a very classy lady, and a leader. You've given black women coming after you something beautiful to emulate by example. It's always refreshing when you see someone who looks like you, who walks the talk without a lot of lip service and does it with such grace and style. While many of you may know bits and pieces about this legend that we have here in our midst, 
I wanted to share a few things about her four decade plus beautiful decorated career and her contributions to North Texas, many of those directly impacting Dallas that you may not be aware of. Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, she's serving her 13th term representing the district, district representing district 30th, 30th District of Texas. She's the first African American and first female ranking member of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. She was the first African American woman to represent Dallas in the United States House of Representatives and the first nurse, black or white, to be elected to the United States Congress. Congresswoman Johnson has a distinct reputation as a stateswoman that crosses the aisles to get things done. She is widely recognized as one of the most effective legislators in Congress, credited with authoring and co-authoring more than 150 bills passed by the House Senate and signed into law by the President. As I mentioned before getting into politics, she was a nurse yet still a public servant. She was born and reared in the segregated Waco, Texas, attended St. Mary's College in Indiana, where she received a degree in nursing. She then transferred to TCU in Fort Worth, where she received a bachelor's degree in nursing. She then later attended SMU, where she earned her master's in public administration. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to reiterate, she did all this in the 60s and 70s, when things were far different than they are today. Congresswoman Johnson entered politics as a senator in 1986. Her particular concerns at that time were health care, education, public housing, racial equality, and economic development. Unfortunately, sounds like we got stuck in a time warp, as there, <laughs> these are the very same yeah, issues that we seem thing. to be facing in 2017. She's an avid supporter of the rights of concerns of women, not only women, not only American women, but women from around the world, which is what got my attention initially. Congresswoman, I've had the honor and privilege of traveling across five continents the past two decades and Africa extensively since 1999, and I've gotten to see firsthand the plight of women. And because of that, I give you an extra special salute for your tireless pursuit of equality for women in particular globally. Congresswoman, I personally have been immensely moved by your A World of Women for World Peace Forum. It's a beautiful, inspirational program that not only empowers women from around the world with outstanding speakers and the opportunity to listen and truly hear different points of view, but it also reminds us in America how truly blessed and privileged we are. Last but certainly not least, about this icon, Dallas-Fort Worth has benefited tremendously from Congresswoman Johnson's commitment, dedication, responsiveness to concerns of the business leaders and local elected officials. She has directly impacted us with approximately 1.48 billion in North Texas projects. That's what it be, y'all. 700 million, the largest ever awarded for DART, a billion dollars for dollars. I'm sorry. <laughs> 26 million for the construction of the Dallas Streetcar Project, connecting downtown with Oak Cliff, the Right Amendment Repeal Compromise Legislation, and federal funding for the Love Field Modernization Project, which, if any of you have been to Love Field lately, is truly a beautiful thing to see. Over 220 million in federal funding to date for the Trinity River Project as well as 459 million authorization for the Dallas Floodway Project, ensuring that the least of these are not impacted by rain. Please, I could go on and on and on and on, but please help me with a warm, heartfelt Texas welcome for our illustrious Council Congresswoman, Eddie Bernice Johnson. Good morning. I want you to know that this hour belongs to you. So even though I received a long list of things you wanted me to talk about, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'll talk about whatever you want me to talk about. Uh, 
At my age, my life is an open book. Um, I'm twice your age, so I can probably tell you some things you never heard of. Uh, I will start, however, with the first question that you sent to me, and that is, how did I get from Waco, Texas, to South Bend, Indiana? Well, back during that time, I wanted to be a physician. But my high school counselor said, oh, but girls are nurses. You won't hear that today. But I heard that back then. And so uh, she said, you really need to be a nurse. So I read in one of the magazines that came to my house about becoming a nurse with $30 and a certificate. And I convinced my father to pay $30 for this course. He kept telling me, you know, you need to go to school for that. And I said, but I can be out working when I finish high school. <clears throat> so he paid for it. I did it. I made 100% on all the different tests because you had all the material right there. All you had to do was read it and fill out the blanks. <laughs> and after I finished it, I was telling him how proud I was. They sent me this little certificate. And he said, and then when you walk into the hospital, what is the first thing you're going to do? And I couldn't think of a thing. <clears throat> so he said, if you're going to be a nurse, <clears throat> excuse my voice, I've had uh, vocal cord damage. Uh, he said, you need to go to a nationally accredited school. And so I finally decided that he was probably right. There was not a nationally accredited school in the state of Texas that I could attend. And so we started looking. Uh, my allergist had graduated from Notre Dame, and he's the one who identified the school. Uh, and I came to Dallas to what was then Baylor University Dental School to take an exam to go. And I passed the exam, so they offered me a scholarship. So for the first time, I traveled from Waco, Texas, to South Bend, Indiana, on a train, leaving Waco at 4.30 p.m. one evening and getting to South Bend the next night at 8.30. Now, you go there an hour and a half now. <laughs> and I tell young people that during that period of time I was on that train, I changed trains in St. Louis, went into Chicago, changed trains and train stations. And keep in mind that I was leaving home for the first time by myself uh, before I could get there. And I read three books. And I tell the young people now, now you can get there an hour and a half, and that's the kind of information you need to capture in that hour and a half that it took me 28 hours to capture. Things have changed. But I went there and finished. I didn't see anybody look like me, but it was where I was. You know, at that time when you called home, you had to pay long distance. Now you just pick up your cell phone. And my father said, look, you can't call home every day because we can't afford it. <laughs> he said, put your mind to what you're doing, you'll be OK. And he was right. Um, as I look back on it now, you know, I became a cheerleader for Notre Dame, and it was, you know, the campuses were right adjacent, so we did classes and things together, but it was not co-ed then, it's co-ed now. But all run by the Sisters and Brothers of the Holy Cross. It was a rich experience. It taught me a lot. My parents drove from Waco to South Bend for my graduation. And they drove almost nonstop because there was hardly any place they could stop to get a hotel. Things have changed. My younger sister, who is eight years younger than I am, um, started out at UCLA in nursing, but she finished Baylor. Things have changed. Yes, Congresswoman, we wanted to talk a little bit about your background. What was life like, and who were your role models when you were a little black girl growing up in segregated Waco, Texas. And also wanted to know if you did play sports. You just said something about being a cheerleader. Did you do sports growing up? I did cheerleading. Okay. <laughs> I was 
in a drill team in, in high school, uh, and I played a little basketball. I did almost whatever was available to be done at the time. It's not quite like it is now. I, I'm, I'm 81, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Wear, wearing it well. <laughs> wearing it well. After 16 years heading the psychiatric nursing practice at the VA hospital, we would like to know what was the catalyst that made you feel a need or a desire to get into politics? Well, I grew up in a family that was very active in the community. My mother and father were very active. And when I came to Dallas, I came just after leaving South Bend, Indiana. And I connected with the YWCA. I'd grown up a block from the black YWCA in Waco. And I was accustomed to having comfort zones of people uh, around me. So I, I sought that membership and got involved here uh, with the YWCA. I went back for a wedding for my roommate at Notre Dame a year later. And in the process of preparing to go back, I went downtown to shop. And that's when I realized that I could not try on clothes in these stores downtown. Could not try on a hat, could not try on shoes. I went to Boke Brothers, what was then Sanger's, A. Harris's, and I was stunned because even in Waco, Texas, you could try on clothes. Uh, so I went back to the wedding after thinking about it, and I came back, and at the YWCA, I met a woman by the name of Yvonne Ewell, and one by Imelda Brooks. And we organized a barcode of downtown. Um, and it did change things. As a matter of fact, let me do that quickly and move on. Uh, the first store that opened was Neiman Marcus, and I met Stanley Marcus, and that's the person who gave me the opportunity so I could run for office later. Uh, but it made for a lifelong relationship there. Wow. We don't hear that part in the history books. You haven't read my book yet. Oh, okay. I have to do that. I have to do that. I keep putting off the publication because I'm trying to retire so that I can say whatever I want to say. That's the truth that I've never said before. So that's why you haven't seen this book yet. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward. A recent study found that black women as a group vote more than any other demographic, which was something I didn't know until I started doing research, but are at least likely to run for political office. What barriers running for office did you have to overcome? I can only imagine what those were. And what do you think stops women these days from getting into politics more? Some of them are very real issues. First of all, starting young is better. Because first of all, you get the experience at a young age and you can gain from the experience. Don't ever think you know everything the day you get in. And that's really about the time that women are childbearing age. And so their first responsibility, frankly, is to be a parent. And that's not true just in running for office. That's true in a lot of professions. And you know, I, I really focus a lot on STEM education. And what we are learning is that that is also a barrier for uh, progressing in those scientific fields as well. But it is a great responsibility. It takes all the time you can give it. Uh, when other people are off, you're still working. For this example, this weekend, today, in San Antonio before the Fifth Circuit is redistricting. I spent the entire weekend talking to witnesses, sharing my experiences, and sharing with the attorneys what I think are the highlights of some of this case. I've been in redistricting court all my life, seems like, uh, but we never seem to get it really done uh, more recently. And so uh, don't ever think you're going to have a weekend off. Uh, there's hardly any day 
when you're in public office, that is not something to do. I've gotten to the point now where I write down a list of things that I need to do and I just check them off as I finish. And often you don't finish that. It is very time consuming. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Congresswoman, we now want to talk a little bit about your cool, understated style. <laughs> You came into politics at the same time as your contemporary Barbara Jarton was kind of entering the national stage. At that time, there were few women of any color, nationally or locally. What did you learn from Barbara Jordan or maybe Shirley Chisholm and other women in leadership? And how do you mentor and pass those lessons along to young women like myself who may want to stick our toe in the political waters or just over in being a leader, entering into leadership? Well, first let me comment on uh, Barbara Jordan and I were very, very close, closer than most people probably would realize because we were in constant contact with each other. Ironically, back during Barbara Jordan's day, I was considered the militant one of the two. Wow. <laughs> And so every appointment that Barbara Jordan took in Texas, she checked it out with me first. I have me to go check and see what the audience was like. Uh, she never had a desire to speak with a one race audience. And so she called me, she said, Eddie Bernice, I've got a letter here that talks about me coming to check that group out for me. And so I did that. And uh, we remain very, very close the whole time. We, our, our, our profiles and our way of lives were very different, but we did have that in common. Beautiful. Now, in terms of mentoring, I try to, I've had groups that I call future leaders, or, and you try to mentor for growth. The problem I have is time, having the time to be consistent. Uh, and I sometimes wait for young people to reach out to me. You, wanna, you don't want to take anything for granted that someone wants to hear uh, from you because uh, this is not a job that is the same every day. And you have to be ready for all of those changes. And some people say, why are you quiet? Well, first of all, you got a whole lot of listening to do in the job. And sometimes, unless you are well read, it's best not to comment unless you have done your homework. Now, you have a lot of personalities that just like to be on the news, and that's okay, I don't have any problem with it. But when you do that off the cuff, you normally have to come back and eat part of what you've said. Uh, I try to do my homework. I also try to save my energy for where it's gonna work. <laughs> I work every day, all day, but I have an outline of what I'm going to do that day. If I'm working on a bill, I, I have an outline of who I'm going to talk with. Um, when I get all these request lists from the city, county, state, I look at that, I have to name who I'm going to talk with, and I spend my time working that. And when you said I got a half million bill, I got over, I've gotten over a billion dollars just for dark. Um, but I don't, it doesn't come that easily. You have to do your homework, you have to build the relationships, you have to justify what you're asking for. And the one thing I can say about the city of Dallas and DART, and even the state for that matter, they send good information. You've got to have the details. Every time I call to try to get something, I can answer those questions. And if I, I question myself before making the call. If I don't have all the information, I'll call back to the city, I'll call back to the state, but that's time consuming because all while you're doing that, you got to go to committee meetings, you got to interrupt that to run the vote. Somebody's coming in to see you. Everybody who comes to Washington think that they can see you, and I do my best to see as many people as I can, but when I leave home in the morning, my day starts about 5.30. Um, and I leave home probably around 7, 7.30. Uh, try to run to the gym, stay on my feet because I'm 80. Uh, and, and, and then you'd never know when you're going to get home. And when you get home, you're certainly not going home to go to bed. You've got to go home and prepare for the next day. So 
it is very, very time consuming. It's very important that when you get a request from a government or a municipal or whatever, that you cross all the T's and dot all the I's before you make a call to do something about fulfilling it. You read it to make sure all your, your questions are answered and you anticipate what those departments will answer. Now, I have been very fortunate in that I have worked not stop before this past election. I have worked well with three eight-term presidents. Uh, I knew all of them before they became presidents, and I knew many cabinet members, which has helped. I can't say that about this administration, but if you give me a little time, I'll do that too. But, but, the, but the thing is, you point out, you get in your own mind who you need to know. And then I have had staff from my own staff that I have pushed into different positions and because I'm careful about who I hire, I have high expectations, but I also make sure that they have opportunities to move. Now, you can't work for me unless you're smart. <laughs> I mean, you've got to do your work. You know, I'm known for hiring and firing until I get it right, and it's true. Because if I don't have smart people, I can't be smart. That's true. That's true. So, I can't do it all by myself. Everybody has to have a team. And so I have had, I have plugged in some of my people into different portions of the administration uh, so that I could have an inside contact. And so I have known cabinet members and even under President Bush when I think about uh, when he became president, I became chair of the CBC at the same time, that's Congressional Black Caucus. And so it's our responsibility to meet with the incoming president. So I wrote a letter, and he called me on the telephone. He said, what y'all want to meet with me for? And I had known him since before he ran for governor, of course. And I said, because we want to let you know what we stand for. And it's not just black interest. We're the conscience of the Congress. We look at the world. And we don't concentrate on just black issues. We concentrate on issues of the world. He said, really? I said, yes. So I gave him a list, and at the last thing on the list was Africa. And he went, what? I said, Africa. He said, well, why Africa? I said, that's our motherland. <laughs> and AIDS epidemic was at a peak. And so he said, OK. So we went over. And he gave us 40 minutes. So after we'd been there an hour and 40 minutes, I stood up because Cheney was about to have a stroke. <laughs> and I said, Mr. President, I realize that we've gone over the time, and we really appreciate it. He said, but you ain't leaving without talking about Africa. So I've had Condi in here, and, and we've been talking about Africa all afternoon. So we talked about Africa. That's the only thing he can truly be proud of post-presidency is his relationship that he established with the continent of Africa. And just last week when the president of Liberia was here, she said, I've only been to Dallas one other time, and I came to see President Bush. Now, uh, is there any press here? Well, I want to tell you exactly what happened with that relationship. <laughs> Please. I kept saying, we cannot forget the most resourceful continent on the planet. Absolutely. And uh, we've got to give it attention. So he then said, uh, he then said, OK, let's see what we can do. He had um, Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice, whom I was very close to both, to add up through every department budget, got every department to add up every line item that had anything to do with Africa. And he got the total. And he had a Rose Garden meeting and had all the African ambassadors and all leaders to come to announce what he was going to do for Africa. <laughs> now, that's the same thing that had been already appropriated. But they had never heard the total in totality. Nor had I. And for that, at, after that, Africa became very dedicated to President Bush. And it also led for a very good working relationship 
uh, with me and, and President Bush. About the only thing we had a real uh, not so nice discussion on was the Trinity River. Uh, because as he came in, if you recall, the second year, we became a majority again. I've been in a majority six years out of 25. Uh, and I moved myself to chair the subcommittee on water because we need to do something about the Trinity. And he kept saying, you're spending too much money. I said, listen, it was your administration who did the research. And we don't have quite as much as what they said we ought to be spending every term for the next 20 years to catch up. It said 19 billion. We have a 17 billion dollar bill here. So he sent it back to me a couple of times and we modified a little bit, but that 17 billion just didn't go away. And so I told um, one of his top aides, because I've got to be pretty close to it. I get close to the White House staff because I have to do my business. Um, <laughs> And I said, look, you look at this. This is a needed bill. We have got to pass it. And then I did my homework. I went to the leaders on that, on that committee, and I said, if you got anything in this bill, you got to stay with it all the way. At any time you think you can't vote to stay with it, your project comes out. And so I had problems with Florida. I said, OK, we, we, we just take the project out. So we just took the project out. And they came back and said, no, they changed their mind. Put it back in. <laughs> and so the chairman of the full committee was having surgery. So it was all left to me to orchestrate this bill. And we got it through the House and Senate and went to the White House. And Carl Rowe called me and said, Eddie Bernice, now you know we have problems. I said, Carl, don't let him veto this bill. I said, because we need it. I said, I'm going to tell you what else. If you veto it, we might get an override. He said, I said, well, just tell him if he doesn't want to sign it, let it go into law without his signature. Just hold on for 10 days. So he said, OK. So that Friday, that Sarah is going to be the 10th day. That Friday I called. I said, Carl, what's going on? He said, I've advised him not to veto it. That Saturday morning he vetoed that bill. That Tuesday we overrode it. And that's one of the first times that we were able to do that. But that Trinity River stuff out there was passed that way. And I said to him, I went to the White House two days later, and he went, and I went. <laughs> And so we've been, he called and started calling me Miss Trinity, and that's okay. I said to him, are you going to move to Dallas when you finish? He said, if I can find something I can afford. I said, I just need the address. And we, we laugh about it today. I said, I need to build a trench from the Trinity to your door <laughs> so that when it floods, you'll be the first to know. Yes. <laughs> so that's the kind of relationship we still have. Uh, I don't curse people out and fuss and carry on because it doesn't do anything but make you mad. Right, right. But I will go face to face and sit down and talk with someone and try to convince them that my way is the best way. Now, I don't always win, but I do my very best. I won't get some. Because if you do your homework and you stay at it and you're not floor showing, I'm not on the floor talking all the time. If you are on the floor talking all the time, that's all you're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody else pays you any attention up there. Now, you might be entertaining the public here, but up there, if you're talking all the time, don't nobody pay you any attention. If you look, you some people that talk all the time, if they ever look at, you look at the audience, ain't nobody sitting out there. Right. Because they'll get up and leave. Because that's a waste of your time. But it is entertaining for those who are watching C-SPAN. <laughs> <laughs> Congresswoman, early in your career, what perceptions about black women did you have to encounter or did you feel and did you feel any pressure to prove them wrong or right or did you just do things on your own terms understanding and realizing that you were blazing trails for those behind you 
Well, you never know whether you're blazing trails or not, but what I, have de what I did determine, I knew before I got into public office I was black. I knew that long time before I got into public office. And I knew I was from Waco, Texas, which was the deep south. And I knew I was a woman, so, and, I, and I would say all the time, my parents did not know the technique was not available to know what I was going to be, male or female, but the one thing they knew, I was going to be black. Now, my father's grandmother was white and was Irish. And she, was, she taught us lessons about how it was a difference in how they treated people her color and to treat people my color. And she would say sometimes, don't marry nobody real dark, they don't treat the children right. Well, I learned that to be true. Uh, it might, it, and I learned why it was true. Not necessarily just because one is lighter than the other, but because when you mix with African blood, you are uh, not the same in this country. You work for your rights. And so I've accepted that. I have never tried to be white. I've got white first cousins and all of that. And we get together and we enjoy each other. They go their way and I go mine. I know what my life uh, is like here in the United States. And I accept that. I still think I've traveled the world and I've seen all over the world. Uh, this is the best country I've ever been to. Amen. Me too. And, and I will stand for it and I will say it to young people. You can't control who you're born to. You can't control even what they name you, because if you did, you sure wouldn't have some of these names. Uh, you, you can't control any of that. It's what you choose to do about it, to make yourself happy. And if you can't make yourself happy, at least satisfied. I wanted to say, uh, she brought up the president of Liberia. I just wanted to let everyone know that she was here. She's the first president, Sirleaf, the first woman president of Africa. So she was just visiting with us here two weeks ago, just to let you know. Congresswoman on making a difference. The Congressional Black Caucus, an organization that you once led, recently declined an invitation to talk to our illustrious president. Without getting into the politics of it all on the Hill, what advice do you have for organizations that are in leadership transition, kind of like the city right now, we're in transition leader for leadership, with leadership. What are the advantages of, and how can those with new ideas mix with and capitalize on the wisdom of those with more experience in an organization? Well, let me comment on the uh, invitation to see the president. As I mentioned earlier, it is a routine that the Congressional Black Caucus visits with every newly elected president and build a relationship most of the time and go back often. Um, when we were invited, uh, first of all, we wrote to this president and asked to see him. And when he set it up, it was set up like a reception. And we want no reception. We want a business meeting like we normally have. And we have 49 members of the Congressional Black Caucus. When I chaired, it was 36. Um, and we said we'd like a sit-down meeting. And we were never committed to that. So what we decided to do is send the elected officers of the caucus. Now, let me tell you what that did. The elected officers are normally the newest people. Uh, the, the leaders usually been there four or five terms, but people like Charlie Rangel, John Conyers, me, Elder Holmes Norton, we don't seek that leadership, we mentor at this stage in our career. And so he knew that if he settled for the officers, he was not going to be seeing the mature people. And so, but that's what he got to see. And they took a 138 page document of our goals and the research to back them up for discussion. And I'll be the first to admit that yes, they were 
some pretty green members. But let me tell you, real green people don't get there. We all get there by the same process. And so I think he felt that we had shortchanged him. And so he sent his African-American outreach person who came, was from the show that he was on on TV and <laughs> said, and, and we all got an individual little note, and said, we had an invitation going out to every member of the Congressional Black Caucus and only a few showed up. We'd like to invite every member of the Congressional Black Caucus. So we had a meeting, we do every week, and we decided that when he responded to the document that we submitted to him, we would all go, but we didn't want to go. We don't want to be in the White House drinking tea and laughing and talking with each other. We've all done that, except for the new people. I've been doing it since I've been there. I can tell you everywhere you can go in the White House, where every little secret, whatever. That is not what we are there for. Our agenda is a serious business. And so we didn't want any photo ops with us grinning and smiling with tea and cookies. <laughs> we want to take care of business. And until we feel that we can get an audience with him to take care of business, we will not be going. Right. Thank you. So there. <laughs> <laughs> When you reflect on your legacy of service, not just to Dallas, but to the nation, what are you most proud of accomplishing at this point? You know, I don't know. I, I think that for the international work, most of that interest started after 9-11. I was, I was in Washington when that hit, and I was in the Capitol at a meeting that morning. And, and I had to leave, that's when I was doing these little weekly TV shows, and I left to go to do that. And I walked out in the hall, and everybody's running. And I had to figure out what was going on. They said, get out of the building, get out of the building. So I kept going. And I went outside and turned around and looked up, and the Pentagon was on fire. And you just can't imagine what kind of feeling you have when the seat of your defense has been attacked. And that seat of defense is for our nation, but it really is a seat of defense for the world. I couldn't use my phone. I had one phone that was not in the network, and it rang, and it was my district director back here saying, what's going on? I said, I'm trying to figure it out. I said, I'm standing out here in front of the Capitol and I see this fire, but I don't know what else has happened. So then the guard said, well, start walking. So we start walking and three or 4,000 people were just walking. Nobody knew where we were going. We were just walking, getting away from the hill. So I ended up at the Democratic National Committee office and I said, what is going on? I had not even heard about the New York stuff. And then, uh, they said, somebody's coming for you. So I, I look up and hear six captive policemen coming for me to take me to the dugout where it's a hidden place where we go when disaster has hit. And they kept telling me all the way over there, nobody knows where this is. So we turned the corner to go to it, and it was 10 blocks of reporters. I said, you mean nobody knows <laughs> where this is? But anyway, in that dugout is when they explained to us what was going on. And, and the Hill was in a state of shock for at least a month. Well, I woke up one morning and picked up my stack of me reading U.S. News and World Report. The cover on it had two African boys, 12 and 14, from Liberia, all dressed in military garb with machine guns. And I thought, we can't deal with this. We cannot be a world of war. And I thought of doing something, but I felt so small in the speck of the world to try to do anything. But it came to me to do a world of women for world peace. And that's when that started. 
And I called here to the Peace Center and I said, I've got to do something. I want to do something to start building a culture of peace in the world. And I was told by Jan Sanders to call Swanee Hunt, who is the youngest daughter of H.L. Hunt here at Harvard. I called Swanee and she said, come up here Friday. This was a Wednesday. <laughs> come up here Friday. So I got on a plane and went to Harvard that Friday. And the, the, what is now the president of Liberia was a student in her class. And she had a group of women from around the world, and they were named Women Wagering Peace. And I dialogued with those women. Two of the women in there that day ran for presidents of their country, the one in Liberia and the one in Chile, and they won. The one in Liberia said, I've been thinking about running, and if I do, there will never be another child soldier. And she ran a year or two later, and there has never been another child soldier in Liberia. That's the beginning of our relationship. That was in 2001 in October. Uh, she did go home and run. She became president. She's in her uh, terminal term now. But when she came here last week is when, um, and of course during the Ebola, uh, Ebola crisis here, I was a contact for Presbyterian, the attorneys and all to her because I knew her personally. We'd kept in touch. And she was the one who got all the information, the background of the man that had it, who his legitimate children were, who his wives and all of that stuff. And so when I was asked to do a reception for her, I was delighted. She's an AKA and she's a link. And she's an AKA by, she said, basic sisterhood. <laughs> and she's a link by honorary. But I have been with her in both groups on a national basis. And she comes to Washington at least once a year, uh, as most of the African leadership will, uh, to spread their story. So this was. Uh, a personal relationship. In the meantime, I have 56 countries that have bought into uh, the peace building uh, that I've used um, all kind of, I've traveled to the places, I've used Skype, uh, I lecture, not lecture, they call it a lecture, but it's really a dialogue with certain groups, with Bahrain, I have to write the Constitution for Frank for, for uh, Iraq, where I've traveled several times, uh, for um, Afghanistan, uh, to get especially women involved. And in researching the peace movement in this country, uh, that's how Mother's Day began. The woman who was a mother in the Civil War who said, I didn't give birth to my son to be killed at war. And I don't think any other mother did. And we got to stop this war, which started, the, her movement started that led to Mother's Day a little right after the Civil War in this country. And so the UN uh, adopted a program that was developed at The Hague uh, that teaches peace techniques. And that's the program that I sell uh, when I go to all these countries. I've been all over the Eastern European countries, all over Africa, uh, all over the Middle East, uh, to talk about this program. Now, what I do is get in touch with these embassies to get together the leading women uh, as I visit these countries. And we, Singapore is the only country, because it's small, that has totally adopted the entire curriculum from preschool all the way through high school is being taught in bits and pieces uh, in this country. And I have handled it myself in Iraq and Afghanistan and Bahrain. And in some in China. I do an annual uh, lecture with the University of Beijing. Uh, I use uh, Radio Free Europe um, and the radio program that I go to there in DC and talk to 50 or 60 countries at a time but trying to make sure that young people learn how to do conflict resolution without war. Beautiful. We have got to stop 
war. Yes. War is so expensive. Do you know Iraq costs us $80 billion a month? Think of what we could do with $80 billion a month in this country. You know, you go to Iraq and you don't, I mean, I was with the first delegation went to Iraq after Saddam Hussein was brought down. And you don't even know who the enemy is. And during World War II, I've been to Normandy, went there with President Bush at one time, all over the place. But you know, during World War II, uh, Vietnam, Korea, wars, there were demarcations. I've been to the 38th parallel line in Korea, I don't know how many times, I've been to North Korea. But when you go to these wars now, there's no demarcation. There's no identified enemy. So these people can be sleeping on this ground right next to one of them and get up the next morning, the gun's in their face. It is a very different situation. And we have a very different profile of a military person because it's all voluntary. You know, way back during the other play, they had, they had the draft. And so you had role models. There are no role models now. When you look at who's going in now, the 18-year-olds, who are looking for a college education or looking for some kind of training. There are hardly any role models in there. So that's why they come out on 99.9% .9 with post-traumatic stress syndrome. Mm -hmm. Because they go in looking for a better life and what they're facing is a very different world, a different kind of war. So I don't know what that question was. No, I was <laughs> <laughs> it's OK. I we're we're, we're about it. This, about our military. It, right. it, Congresswoman, we knew we were going to run out of time. Unfortunately, this has been wonderful. We're going to take a few questions from the audience. But before we do, just in closing, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, you are a wonderful, beautiful example of how it's supposed to get done. Please know that we as an organization, we love you, we honor you, and your service to the city and to our country. But we especially appreciate your giving us someone who looks like us to look up to and to emulate. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a living example of My Black is Beautiful, Black Girls Indeed Rock, Black Don't Crack, <laughs> and Black Girl Power all rolled up into one phenomenal woman. I know that my mom always said she wanted her accolades on this side of the dirt. And a little girl growing up in Kansas City, you know, didn't, we didn't really understand what is mama talking about? But you get to understand it as you, as you live and learn. So we're giving you your accolades on this side of the dirt. Thank you. Thank you. At Jill. this time, I wanted to bring up um, our president, Sharita Johnson. Congresswoman, I want to personally thank you for um, agreeing to come and speak to our group and other city employees. It was, I want to say, back in April, I think I got the confirmation from your uh, chief of staff uh, in Washington, and it came around 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and so when I woke up, and that was around 6, and I'm, you know, looking at my, my emails, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, she's coming. And it was just like that. She did not hesitate. And I'm just telling you, she is a fabulous sister, because I'm also an AKA. And just what she just said, <laughs> reach out to her, and she will come. And that's exactly what she did. So on behalf of Bess, and also the city of Dallas, we would like to thank you for your time, your inspiring words, and your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And with that, we would like to give you our Breaking the Fourth Wall trophy. Did I drop something? Uh, no, ma'am. OK. Can I take a little picture? Thank you very much. Any closing remarks? Well, did you say we're going to be a couple of questions? Yeah, did we have time for a couple of questions, Sharita? Danielle, did we have any? Uh, did you get any from the house? Okay. So, okay. Oh, I have a mix. Just bring me 
Ah, okay. So the first question is, how do you juggle family life with your political life? That's a good one. I schedule them just like I schedule everybody. <laughs> I do have to schedule in order to take the time, but I do take the time. I bring them to see me there, and I schedule time to see them here. Okay. And then the uh, second question is, what can citizens do to assist in pushing for bipartisan participation in the health care bill? That's a very good question, because we're right in the middle of that. Just keep pushing to make sure that we have a fair bill. Actually, uh, the bill that, was, that is in effect could use improvement. But you can't find a better bill with the better things that it requires, no matter how hard they look. Now, we realize that the insurance companies feel put upon, and they manipulated to try to get rid of it. But for the first time, in the history of this country, people have a right to buy insurance that will not have a lifetime cap that can cover the children till they're 26. And you know, from 18 to 26, most of the time is the time they don't need insurance. And also, they don't all get dumped over into Medicare when they get 65. Now, if you pay insurance all your life, and then get sick at your later years, that's when they don't want to cover you. And health insurance has been the most profitable business in this country. Nobody should profit on the backs of sick people. Amen. It should be enough for them to stay healthy financially. But for the first time, insurance companies are not in charge of your health care. And we hope to maintain that. It was never intended for insurance company to be the cash care on the backs of people's health. Right. And I hope that we can maintain many of the provisions that are there. The interesting thing is, if you look back on the campaign, President Trump promised the four major things would stay intact. Well, if those four major things would stay intact, you will have the Affordable Health Care Act. What we could not fix is the price fix and provision that would hold those insurance companies at a point of what they can charge. Uh, if we could do that, they wouldn't be tearing it up now because when, it, when election time came, all the rates went up. And so we have to continue this battle until they figure out that they can live with a good profit and treat people right at the same time. Amen. Unfortunately, this concludes our program. Um, hopefully, if we've been nice enough to you, you can come back and see us, and we'll have a part two. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. This is William, hopefully your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below or like follow or subscribe to us and get notices of all our videos. We love it even when you call.